if I mention the names Dietrich Bonhoeffer and Frederick Douglass, many of you would recognize them as significant leaders in our history. But if I mention the name Dr. John Perkins, it might not be a name as familiar to you. Yet, over the last 57 years, Dr. Perkins has been leading social justice efforts in the areas of racial reconciliation and community development. Now, Dr. Perkins' story or, or some aspects of his story are very similar to Dietrich Bonhoeffer and to Frederick Douglass. Uh, both of these men spent time outside of the context that they were raised in and grew up in or, or their home. Uh, and they were able to uh, be away from some of the oppression or the evil regime, uh, e evil regimes and uh, the uh, racial uh, suppression. Uh, that would be Germany for Dietrich Bonhoeffer. And that would be right up the road from here, Maryland, for Frederick Douglass, who was a former slave. Um, but these men didn't feel uh, complete in this uh, separation that they had from where they were from and from this oppression. And uh, they felt compelled to actually respond to what their brothers and sisters were dealing with at home. So Bonhoeffer would actually return to Germany and face the injustices there by Hitler. And Frederick Douglass would return back to the U.S. Uh, from Europe to become one of the leading voices in the abolitionist movement in the mid-1800s. Dr. John Perkins would actually do the same thing. See, he's from Mississippi, and he experienced a lot of brokenness growing up. He actually uh, didn't really know his mother. She died of extreme hunger and didn't really have a relationship with his dad. And uh, even as he got older, he experienced a lot of pain that, we, that you will hear in the interview uh, today. And so his family actually sent him away to California to actually preserve his life. And he actually thrived and gained some freedoms. But he later became a Christ follower. And then he too felt compelled to go back to the pain, go back to Mississippi, this place of oppression, so that he could tear down the walls of segregation and all that he had experienced there. Pastor Dave and I uh, had the opportunity along with about three members of our staff to go down and sit at the feet of Dr. Perkins at the Perkins, Perkins Foundation uh, for Reconciliation, Justice, and Christian Community Development. And so what you're about to see are just a few of those moments that we had with Dr. Perkins in Jackson, Mississippi. And we tried our best to compile the best of what he has uh, to offer to us. And so our ask of you this weekend is for you to lean in and listen to the heart of one of the fathers of the faith, a man who has gone before us, a man who is calling us into this journey with him, a man who has something to teach us. Now 87 years young, let's dive right into this conversation with Dr. John Perkins. You write in 1946 that you were 16 years old and uh, your brother uh, was uh, shot and killed. And that was a, a turning point for you. Can you, can, you, can you talk about that? Yeah, yeah. him going in the service, uh, probably at 19, whatever, spending his three or so years coming back. And like to me, that was a hero of mine. And of course, I, uh, then him, you know, fighting Hitler, come back home, uh, enjoying himself, but with a sort of a new look at the world. And, it, it, and so he and his girlfriend was at the theater in line, and, 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 and Marsha would keep the black in a line because they had to get in a line and go through an alley to go into the back, to go into the theater. And of course, one of the things he would do, the kids would be talking loud. And, and of course, young black men all coming back from the military is got a little bit more freedom. And, and, and so the, he would take a blackjack and hit these kids on the head and make them get in line. And so he hit my, my they were probably talking loud, him and his girlfriend and thing. They had, had to whisper. White folks don't kids don't whisper when they are going somewhere. They have a 
uh, the other national, you know what I mean? But we had to whisper because we would disturb the white folks. And so they, that, that was a custom. And he hit him on the head. He just spin around and caught the club. And he then just backed up and shot him two times in the stomach. That was a real blow to me. And the blow was really something because after my brother died and I'm 16, now our family was not one of these church going families. We would have been like the drug pushing family. We would have been a little bit like the gang family. You know what I'm saying? And so uh, my, my, many of my uncles had got in trouble, so we wasn't, wasn't a, the, the church go to meeting quite black people. And so what they would have thought, when I would go on the streets and be black boys and men would be standing on the street, and when I would join that group, these other folk, would, black folk, would walk away because they were afraid that the white folks would see me talking to them and I'm planning a gang deal. And so you could see that and my family could see that. So then they, they and so they w encouraged away. me to go to California because we had a cousin, a first cousin who had grew up with us. So that's how you got to California? I got went to California to get out of there. And, uh, and what happened to me, people said, did you go with a lot of hate? Yeah, but I went with a lot of hate in my soul, but my hate was solid on these white folks who was from Mississippi. I got to California, I got new opportunities, freedom, a new freedom. Not, not total freedom, but I got enough freedom to work, a good job, and that's what most people want. So I want to ask you, you come back to Mississippi. It's a completely different world from California. You right. know that, but God has called you back to Mississippi. So you write in your book that February 7th, 1970, you're laying on the floor of the Simpson County Jail, and this is your quote, I decided at that moment to preach a gospel stronger than my racial identity and bigger than the segregation around me. Yeah. What, what does that mean? When I was, we had started a protest march based on the first time I was put in jail in Mendenhall. And you got to realize the fact that we was, they were bombing churches and burning churches in Mississippi. And I was organizing a little church that became the headquarters for the civil rights movement. And so um, uh, on the floor, I, I saw the, the meanness of racism. I saw, I looked at those white folks. They looked like they were surrounded like animals and maggots was all around their head. I saw evil and it was frightening. But I, if I'd had an, uh, an atomic grenade, I would have opened it. But my faith probably spoke to me, and it said, uh, if I do that, I'm worse than them. And I saw in that crisis moment that we was equally broken, that they was evil, and my solution would have been evil. And that's when I said, Lord, I, I want to preach a gospel that can save these white folk, but also save me. I, I want to preach a gospel that where I, a love of God, that was greater than my race, greater than my economic interest. I have a strong economic interest. I want to preach a gospel that can reconcile us to God. And, uh, and I always said, feel like I caught God listening. And I got out of jail. Then I had to go through this terrible time of recovery. That's a, that's a reconciliation. You just hit that. That's the reconciliation. And that's a buzzword in our culture today. I mean, I'm hearing that word all the time. Talk, of, talk about that word and, and where that's in the scriptures. Yeah. Reconciliation is a very essence of the action that comes from the proclamation that we said that we, we said the spirit empowers the word of god 
The spirit and our obedience to that word of God create faith. And it's faith, but it's also grace that, that saves us. That, that when we, and it's got to be for the other. Uh, it's got to be the great commandment. Loving God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind and then loving your neighbor as you love yourself. That's the Good Samaritan story. That's the one who had been off to be. The, the Samaritan story is, is what we would call in life an oxymoron because there wasn't no such thing as a Good Samaritan. They were the most despised of all of the, uh, of all, of all of the Gentiles, because they was a mixed race, you know, there. Uh, and they hated them. They hated them. They was from another temple that was built in rebellion against God. They're not supposed to get together. But then the Samaritan reached out to the Jew and washed his wound and washed the Jewish person wound, the, the Philippian Roman soldier washed Paul's a Jew's wound. And that's uh, that we got to see the equally broken of each one of us. And then we got to somehow or another uh, feel that pain. And feeling the pain, as Martin Luther King says, Suffering for others, undeserved suffering for others, become vicarious. Now, the gospel, I mean, the purpose then of the gospel, the very purpose is to reconcile us to a God who loved us so much he died for us. Once our eyes are open for that, the idea is that we are dying for each other. Greater love than no one in this. I think at this moment, we're at the first time in my 67 years that the reconciliation is going to have to be, the solution is going to be multicultural because the issue is going to be multicultural. I think in reality, we are at a pivot place and the church could shine. The church, I think this is our opportunity in my generation. I would like to give the rest of my life to encouraging us to become that oneness, become those people who are called out of the world into a relationship with Christ and with each other, which they call the church. He have given that responsibility to us. He couldn't say it in the planner. God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself and has given unto the church the ministry of reconciliation. Well, last time we met you, well, actually it was a few months back, one of the opening, I think the very first thing you said was, I want to die empty. Right. I remember writing that, that down. That's a good one. <laughs> I, I want, and I want to pass it on to, really to this Intentional, multi, culture. I think you'll you'll do you're gonna make a lot of mistakes and do a lot of things wrong, but you gotta find a great sense of obedience. One of your van, and that's what God's power was at. God's power is, in, is in, released in obeying His command. And the command was to go into all the world and share this good news of the gospel to all the ethnic groups of the world, to all people. The angel said, Behold, I bring you good news of great joy, which shall be to all people. Ain't no room in that for the kind of a language that divides us. That's what God is in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself and has Boy, we ought to be rejoiced that he give, forgive us of our sin and reconcile us to himself 
And then what comes us, the purpose of reconciling us so that we can join with him in his work. He says, come and help me. What would be one or what would be one story that you could share that that would be brief, a brief story that is a beautiful example of what you're describing uh, that you're I, seeing within the church today? I, I right, I example was in the I think my hospital stay in Mount Bayou was people, friends who had heard about me and who was serving me and being broken, black and white, coming to serve me and then nurturing me. And then when I got out of jail and came back to Jackson, we had started having a, a tent meeting because the crime was so bad and how that one of the policemen here in Jackson, this is after I'd been beaten, began to come to me and want to work with me. And I didn't like him, just sort of, oh, because he looked too much white. He didn't give up on me. And we became friends. And when I came back in California the last time, one of my best friends, and he was the best man in this town, was the sheriff of our county. He's dead and I died last year. We became friends, and I went out there and set up a program that we call it Inside Out. Began to spark white folks in this town to build halfway houses for black and whites when they came out of prison. So I would say the best example is some of the things that I'm seeing. What I'm seeing in uh, uh, in Maryland there, what I'm seeing what you guys are doing. Those are the be best examples, and I'm seeing all of those, and those are the stories that I'm trying to tell. So 1 Kings chapter 18, that's the story of Elijah and there being a drought in the land. He prays for rain to come. He sends his servant to go look for uh, the rain or look for a cloud. His servant comes back several times and says he doesn't see anything. Elijah sends him back uh, and says, go look again. After the seventh time, he comes back and he says, I see a little cloud that's the size of a man's hand. And that's all Elijah needed in terms of hope that rain was going to come. Now, I think we're in an era where people would say, I don't see anything, but you've been in this thing for a long time. And you're saying we're at a pivot point and you see uh, a cloud. Tell us what you see or why do you see that cloud? The cloud to me is framing the gospel message into the incarnation and those biblical principles with intentionality to obey the Great Commission. Those congregations that see themselves as being an intentional reaching out in obeying the gospel, to carry the gospel into all the world, and it's simultaneously in terms of Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the world. That tells the other churches in the community that that is the model and that we are working on that, making that oneness in the community, struggling with that oneness. That cloud is then these intentional cross-culture, inner faith across the barriers, race, class barriers to bring people to Jesus Christ. So you're saying that you're encouraged by what you're seeing right now. I, and that I'm, I'm saying it and it's a cloud. 
in your trajectory over the years? Because you, you've seen a lot of things. You're saying we shouldn't be discouraged. We should be encouraged. We should be encouraged. Encouraged with that. We, we got all of these churches, good ones out there, got a piece of it. Our job is to enter into that division and bring those people out of darkness into this marvelous light where we can hang together. That's First John. So we can be the people of God. And I see that. And that we are working on staying together. I think we are trying to carry out what Henry Ford carried out in the business world. Coming together is the beginning. Working together is progress. Staying together is a solution to our problem. And that problem is that we got to do it together. We, people got to see us doing it together. And we've got to be intentional in doing it together. That's, I'm beginning to, that's that hand. That's that hand I'm seeing in these multicultural church planning, intentionality to do that. that. That's our job. The Great Commission is our job. Uh, the, the God, the idea, in the idea of God is to know him and to make him known and to wish him together and serve him forever. Amen. That's the mission and that's that little cloud that's that little cloud we're uh, you're really known for the three r's and that's been foundational in the ministry that you've done through your organization can you just give us a quick snapshot of the three r's for those that don't know what it is i, I think that's a practical idea of the incarnation first relocation jesus relocated from heaven to live among us he was rejected, but that rejecting became our redemption. You understand? So the first thing we got to go is low. So Jesus calls us to go toward the poor as our identity. He says, for you should see the child in the stable with the poor. And so the idea that Jesus came into our world and the word was made flesh and dwell among us. So we are talking about those three hours, sort of somewhat representing the full incarnation. So relocation into the world. And my slogan for that is go to the people, live among them, love them, plan with them, learn from them, start with what they know, build on what they have. And the best leaders like us will say, the people will say, we've done it ourselves. That's relocation. Reconciliation is, of course, you're going to the poor to empower the poor so they can share in the resources of this world. How do we get those resources back? I know it's confronting because people are going to say to them, you are talking about taking all the money from the rich and giving it to the poor. I'm going to say, do you think I'm a fool? The rich would have it back tomorrow night. <laughs> what we have got to do is to help the poor to learn how to utilize those resources. But they can't pull themselves up by their own bootstrap. In many cases, they have no bootstrap. That's what we bring them, good news. And so redistribution, relocation, getting them there, reconciliation was our mission. Redistribution is the quality of life we live together. And how do we extract from this? The earth is a law. This ain't no communism. This is no uh, give them a fish and they'll eat for a day. Teach them how to fish and they eat for a lie. That's a lie. Whoever owned the pond and managed the pond determined who eat fish. Paul says suffering produces endurance, endurance character, character hope. Richard Rohr says that there comes a point in the second half of life where success doesn't really teach all that much anymore. Pain and suffering are your greatest teachers. I, Any thoughts on that? I, now, some of this is my hope. Some of this is my warning that um, that we learn deeper in pain, and that we need to begin to embrace it 
I think there's a leaning in the scripture in the suffering of Christ. I think that's what Gibson tried to do in the Passion. He tried to show us that the pain, and I remember watching it in the movie, in the movie right over here, in, uh, not in town, in the suburb. Uh, the people was crying when he was being tortured. And I was smiling because I had been tortured the same way, but I knew the body could take it. The body could take it. And suffering became redemptive and vicarious. So the idea, one of the scriptures that encourages me is we move along for the joy that was set before him. He endured the cross. Jesus, as God, eternal, had something to learn when he was here on earth. And it came out of his pain. He learned obedient to the Father because he had been equal with the Father. I have a friend, important friend, great friend. Uh, he said he's white, and he's one of the richest people in America, wealthiest guy in America. And he said, one of the problems right now is that, and this is just a problem of different an environmental problem, you know, you know, not race or culture, it might be culture, but uh, the white people have lent into their privilege and think that privilege is automatic. And the problem is they haven't learned how to suffer. And they get mad when they have to suffer. They don't know how to, uh, and this massive, this is massive. This is not individual, because we can learn individually. You understand? But we haven't learned how to suffer. Um, thank you. Thanks for being with us. I wonder if a way that we close this time is that you pray over not only Pastor Josh and I, but you pray over our congregation. Um, all of our, all eight locations that are listening right now. Father, thank you so much for what you are doing in our world. Thank you for that cloud of witnesses that we see coming in this congregation like uh, their congregation that you are raising up and extending that love out to the world and embracing them not just as an object of mission, but as a planner of a church where their own contribution can go both ways, where we really love each other and share our life together. And so Lord, bless these nurturers, uh, these people who is there to receive these people. Oh Lord, guide them, guide them, and then give them the idea that they are to be disciples within the context of the body that is a living entity that can send others out and can support others. A whole church taking a whole gospel on a whole mission to the whole world. So bless this church as we separate here. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Man, it's great. It's great. It's great. If you guys need to call me or something to for some little piece you didn't understand. Okay. He was out he was out. And he didn't get a chance to interpret it for it. Yeah. Translate it. <laughs> he didn't get it. He, he didn't get, that's the subject. Translation. Y'all y'all remember Samson and Son, don't you? Yes, sir. Yeah. You remember the policeman? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah the black policeman? Right. Had to interpret. <laughs> <laughs> had to interpret everything. Right. Sometimes I'm preaching in the church and uh and I my ebonic will come out. <laughs> and it's beautiful when it's a white person, white lady and a black lady together. The, 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 the white person gonna say, what did he say? <laughs> you could, I can see him humping, punching, and, and then he'll be 
translate. <laughs> <laughs> We wanted to try to show you one of the fun moments that we had uh, with Dr. Perkins. Uh, some of the stuff that we talked about, uh, kind of heavy, but we wanted to, you know, lighten it up a little bit. And, uh, you know, speaking of Ebonics, um, you know, which is a colloquial term that has to do with the translation and, and uh, manipulation of the English language by some of my cousins. Um, <laughs> but it reminds me of how important language and translation is. The Great Commission is all about entering into relationship and engaging with people around us in order to translate the gospel. And so essentially, this is what Dr. Perkins has been doing. He's been translating the gospel through racial reconciliation and community development. And it's interesting that the catalyst for this actually started when he left Mississippi to go to California, and then he came back. He experienced a new world. He gained some new freedom, gained new perspective. But then, just like Bonhoeffer and Douglas felt compelled to come back because he knew that there was some pain and some suffering, and there was some work that he needed to do there. Now, you heard Dr. Perkins tell us that we're actually at a pivot point in the church and that we have the opportunity to shine. But I want to tell us that we don't have the opportunity to shine or we lose this opportunity to shine if we stay on our sidelines of the issues debating one another. But we have to enter in and we've got to experience one another intentionally crossing lines of division. And we have to make the word flesh like Jesus did. Now, the three R's that Dr. Perkins talked about relocation, reconciliation, and redistribution. They're all about moving away from the sidelines and getting involved. Now, maybe some of us don't agree with all of Dr. Perkins' execution, and that's fine, but you cannot argue with a lifetime of faithfulness and a lifetime example of what it means to enter in like Christ did, which is what Dr. Perkins is living out, and he's calling us into the same place. Now, what we want to do this weekend as we close, I want to give you some action steps because we, there's some things that we have to do. And actually, I have four. You, and the goal is for you to just pick one of them. And let me just run them off to you real quick. Number one, and we mentioned this last week, we'd love for you to read through the next booklet. And for some of us, this is our opportunity to take the first step. And for others of us who are already involved, it's an opportunity to take the next step. Secondly, maybe some of you will get some friends together and you will want to dive deeper with what Dr. Perkins is talking about. And you will consider reading his book, Dream With Me. This is his latest book and everything that he talked about uh, in this interview is in here. And I would encourage you to do that with some of your friends so you can have some conversation around what Dr. Perkins is telling us. Then I also want to point you to scripture and go to Luke chapter 10 this week and read the Good Samaritan story in verses 25 through 37. This is what Jesus redefines for us who our neighbor is. Yeah. It's not just the people who li- look like us, right. who dress like us, who listen to the same music as us, right. same ideology. No, no. Jesus redefines who that is. Yeah. So we want to encourage you to zoom into that. And then lastly, I want to encourage you to reach out to your campus pastor or your small group director uh, to see who's already involved in this work, who's already having these conversations. Maybe you can join in and you can learn and you can get some of the questions that you have answered because we need to talk about this stuff and we need to grow and we need to learn together. And lastly, let me say this. The gospel of Jesus Christ, it doesn't need to be defended. It needs to be reflected. Amen. And it's reflected by how we live. Acts 1.8, as we close, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses. There's a translation there that says faithful interpreters. So we have power to be faithful interpreters in Jerusalem and in Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. That is our job.